apologetics must, must be a part of church discipleship. That's why morality is relative in America and throughout the West today, because man now determines truth. And I believe that that's why the nation is in the state it's in, because uh, they don't know the Word of God, and because the church has failed, in a sense, to hold forth the Word of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Welcome to Heritage of Truth. Today our guest is Jonathan Bach. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Jonathan is the co-author of the book, The Way Back, How Christians Blew Our Credibility and How We Get It Back. And his co-author is Phil Cook. Yeah. So how did Christians blow our credibility? Well, before we get into all that, we better just okay. explain who uh, you know Phil and I are, okay. right? Sure. Um, and, and that, because that really leads us into it. So. I am a movie and television marketer. Okay. Um, I have a company called Grace Hill Media, and mm -hmm. studios and networks hire me to market films to people of faith. <laughs> I've been doing it for 18 years, and we've okay. done over 500 projects. Wow. Right? I mean, um, A Wrinkle in Time, Unbroken, The Blind Side, The Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings trilogy, okay. um, Narnia. I mean, a, a, a ton of different projects. The Bible series from Mark Burnett, a bunch of things like that. Uh -huh. Phil. My friend Phil is a media and marketing uh, expert on the Christian side of things. He advises some of the biggest ministries and churches around the country mm -hmm. to help them communicate better. Mm -hmm. we, he, we both live in Los Angeles, and, mm -hmm. and we are friends. And as fellow Christians, uh, w w uh, we often get together. and. Because of the world we travel in, uh, stepping on, you know, in, in both sides of both faith and in marketing and media, mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty natural conversation for us to have to talk about what I think all of us have seen happen in our lifetimes, and mm -hmm. that is the slipping of, um, of Christian influence in America, mm. right? Just in our, just in our lifetimes. Right? Yeah. We went from like, parent school is fine, and all of it. I mean, you, we can name 50 topics where what was largely a traditional Christian view of the world happening in America mm -hmm. really start to ebb. Yes. Right? And so Phil and I um, often talk about this mm -hmm. as, a, as a point of conversation. Um, and as we were talking about it, it really led us to, well, maybe we should write a book. <laughs> write a book. <laughs> together mm -hmm. um, and and so for us as as marketers mm -hmm. we tend to look at things through the lens of marketing right, right. I mean uh, with everything right so we look at it and go okay this is a PR problem we're not we have a great product right I mean we've got eternal life and joy and a friend and uh, you know all these great things that come that are free that, yeah. come, that come, you know, if you're looking at just Christianity as a product, it's a great <laughs> product, yeah. right? And yet people are rejecting us, mm -hmm. right? Why is that? What is that? And so our first inclination as marketers was to say, oh, this is a marketing problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's explore that. And so as we started to write this book mm -hmm. with that intention of like, here's how we stop painting ourselves in the corners, here's how we... Um, we fix this marketing problem. It just felt thin to us. We were two thirds of the way through the book and we were like, this isn't the problem. We're not getting at the root of the problem here. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to spend some time and energy really looking into American Christians and their behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. So as a marketer, as a movie marketer, if, if you poll people, about, hey, do you like movies? Well, 100% of people like movies, right? Or 99%, right? <laughs> Everybody likes a movie. Mm -hmm. But as a movie marketer, I'm not interested in those people. I'm interested in people who actually show up to mm -hmm. theaters. They are movie fans, yeah. right? They're the movie fan. Mm -hmm. uh, people who buy DVDs, they're the movie fans. So mm -hmm. we, we decided to look at Christians uh, and say, okay, well, what are our patterns of behavior? And what, what we found was really shocking to us. So we looked at it this way, okay, which is much like a, a, a movie fan, you show up, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are the markers that define us as Christians? How would, how would people know you're a Christian? So mm -hmm. we looked at four simple behaviors. 
do you go to church? <laughs> How often do you go to church, right? Um, do you pray? How do you feel about tithing? And do you read the Bible, right? So we're talking like simple, this is pretty baseline stuff. We're not talking mm -hmm. about like fasting and going on trips to uh, India and Africa on a mission trip, right? I mean, this right. is just like the simple basics, right? Mm -hmm. Of where you're spending your time and energy and money. And those statistics were jaw dropping to us. Mm -hmm. So in America, depending on, uh, you know, we, we went to Gallup and Pew and mm -hmm. Barna and Lifeway Research. I mean, these are skilled researchers. Right. If you talk to them about like church attendance, okay, or, or Christians, in this country, uh, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent, depending on the question you ask, mm -hmm. 70 to 80 percent of this country classifies themselves as a Christian, okay? Mm -hmm. When you get into how often they go to church, only 20 percent of those people are going to church wow. on a weekly basis, okay? And the new rule of thumb in churches, what defines a regular is three out of every eight Sundays or 19 whole times a year oh makes you goodness. a regular in church now. That's terrible. That's terrible. You're exactly right, right? And you take out Christmas and Easter, now you're only talking <laughs> about 17 times, right? 17 wow. times out of 52 Sundays. It's awful. Yeah. So as again, as we keep digging down, it keeps getting worse and worse. Um, uh, um, Bible reading. Now, this is not all Christians. We're talking about people who regularly go to church. Lifeway Research found that 40% of people who regularly go to church rarely or never open their Bible. Oh, my goodness. Right. Exactly. Okay. How, and how, can, how can they live a Christian life if they don't go to the source? Ah, you're asking the right questions now. <laughs> <laughs> not a PR problem, right? Yeah. Prayer. 63% of Christians who regularly go to church say prayer is essential, which we initially looked at it after some of those and we're like, oh, that's great, right? 63%. But hold on, look at the corollary of that. That means 37% of people who are showing up to church regularly don't think prayer is essential. And then tithing, you already know this one's going to be a disaster, <laughs> and it is. Mm -hmm. Less than 10% of regular church attenders give 10%. What we look at this and we go, okay, a PR problem this is not. This is all those things that non-Christians say about us. Mm -hmm. Hypocritical, judgmental, negative, phony. Mm -hmm. Well, you start to look at the stats and you go, they're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're right. They're 100% correct. And our problem, and the biggest problem facing American Christianity right now, it's not ISIS, it's not the gay community, it's not the ACLU. The biggest crisis facing American Christianity is American Christians who mm -hmm. simply aren't living out their faith at all. Wow. So what is the solution? <laughs> right. Well, first, I think the, the first thing is to acknowledge the problem. Mm. We have put ourselves in a position uh, of dictating to people or, or looking at ourselves as the majority and dictating people how they should live their lives. But we're not living it ourselves, mm. right? We essentially have become the fat guy at the gym lecturing other people about good health. <laughs> okay? That's and a good analogy. They, they've stopped listening to us, mm -hmm. right? So issue one is we, we got to get back to work, mm -hmm. right? We got we to gotta get back to the gym and get in shape, yeah. right? And um, right now, I mean, look, working out is hard. Wearing yoga pants is easy. And we have a lot of Christians out there, stats proving it, mm -hmm. that are just wearing yoga pants. They're not, right. they're not doing the hard work at all. And if we're going to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ, we need to, we need to stop setting the bar so low. Yeah. Oh, oh, a regular only comes 19 times a year. When did that get okay? When yeah. did we think as collectively, as a community, that that was okay? Yeah. Right? And not spur each other on to be a little little more devoted, a little more obedient, a little more holy than that. These are words that are not functionally used in most churches mm. these days. We're creating an experience for people, but we're not creating disciples. Mm -hmm. And so step one for us is we gotta get we gotta get back to work. But yeah. if we, if we were looking at this, like I said, like a, a gym analogy, right? Mm -hmm. You don't just head into the gym and like, oh, I'm going to start working out really hard. Like you're going to hurt yourself <laughs> or you're going right. to burn out or whatever right. it is, right? Yeah. And so for Phil and I, we said, well, we need a model. 
we need a model to find the way back here. And so we thought to ourselves, well, where is the place where the church was united and really doing this as they should be doing it? And for us, we had to go back 2,000 years yeah. to the early church. The great news is, is there's a terrific model for mm -hmm. us of how to live a Christian life, and it's right there in Acts. <laughs> and so we look at those guys, and when Jesus departed from the Mount of Olives and left the disciples there, they had nothing. They didn't have a plan. <laughs> They didn't have money. They didn't have political power. They didn't have educations. I mean, yeah. they were fishermen from a backwater Roman province, okay? And in 200 years, they went from nothing to the most influential force in the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? How did they possibly do that? Well, there was a couple things that they did. First off, they were all in 100% committed, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, here's guys that only weeks earlier have um, you know run away from the fight, right? I mean, the, yeah. in the garden, they all they all disappeared yeah. fast. As a matter of fact, just this is a little aside, but we all forget that it was the women. I don't forget. I know, but there's a lot of people who have, including much of Christian culture. The women didn't go anywhere. <laughs> they stood there. They took it. It was the men who departed. But that was weeks before. After Jesus uh, is resurrected, they are all in. Mm -hmm. Even if it means their own death, they are all, and it did. I mean, Christian history yeah. tells us that it did mean ultimately their own death, but they were all mm -hmm. in. So they were fully committed. Mm -hmm. That is step one. But then step two is they had to have a really fresh approach to it because they were underdogs, right? So they approached things with the intent of trying to astonish the culture that they were in by how they were living their lives. Mm -hmm. and. Historians tell us that Roman culture, I'm going to give you an example of it. Roman culture was a culture that had infanticide. Yeah. Okay? And basically what that meant was it was tradition that you didn't even name your child for the first 10 days that you had it. Okay? Because you might decide you don't want it. Oh, it's another mouth to feed. Oh, we didn't want a girl or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And yeah. then if you didn't want it, you would just leave it by the side of the road or in a field or out with the trash. And... Uh -huh. This was Roman culture, and it was very common. And we have letters from uh, soldiers to their wives saying, like, oh, you know, when the baby's born, just, just expose it, and mm -hmm. it would die. And the Christian community who believed in life and who believed every life was valuable did something that the Romans could not fathom. Who is doing this? They started picking up these babies. Mm -hmm. They started taking them into their own house, and mm -hmm. they started raising them at their own. And for a culture that was essentially a culture that was very comfortable with death mm -hmm. uh, in Rome, they couldn't, under, it was mystifying yeah. to them. It's who could do this and why would they do this? And so that's what we looked at as well as another part of our book is what are the things that here we are, modern Christians, okay? We're not starting from zero, mm -hmm. right? We have education, we have money, we have communications, we have a ton of things. What are the things that we can do to astonish the world again? Mm. What are those things, besides us living our lives as we should, mm -hmm. as obedient servants of Jesus, right. what are the things that we can do on a personal level, on a collective level, on a church level, on a church universal level that could astonish culture again? So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The, the world of foster care mm -hmm. is a good example. Okay. Right now in this country, there are 450,000 kids living in foster care system. Essentially, they've been abandoned. They're kids that have been left by the side of the It's a modern day version of kids being left yeah. by the side of the road. The stats on if you are uh, a foster kid are atrocious of what happens when they step out of the foster care system. 25% of those kids within one year will be homeless. 75% of girls who go through the foster care system will be pregnant by 21. Mm. The graduation rate from college is 1%. These are abandoned kids, yeah. okay? And 450,000, that's, that's the size of Salt Lake City, okay? That's, that sounds insurmountable, right? That's a terrible problem. What can I do? What can you do? Nothing. Well, hold on. There's 350,000 churches in this country. Mm. So you do a little math and you go, okay, 450,000 kids, 350,000 churches. If each church 
had found one family to take one plus kids, mm -hmm. okay? And everybody else in that community supported that family. We could wipe out the foster care system in a year. Completely empty. Yeah. No more kids. And that cycle of poverty and I had another kid and now we're in poverty, like mm -hmm. we end it right there. That's the kind of thing that astonishes the world because nobody wants kids to go through that. It doesn't matter whether you're religious. Nobody wants that for kids. Mm -hmm. And so we, one of the things that we have to do is find ways to astonish the world. And, and it's, the book has examples like that of wow. ways that we can do that on an individual level and uh, on a group level. Let me give you an individual level. And this is near and dear to my heart because uh, I started doing this and uh, then I got Phil and his wife involved. About 10 years ago... Um, I decided to post on Craigslist in the free section of Craigslist mm -hmm. uh, right before Christmas, a couple days before Christmas. Hey, if you find yourself in this section and you're a parent and you're desperately looking for some, a gift, any kind of gift for your kid, write me back. Maybe I can help you. Mm. And that first year I got several letters from totally desperate parents. I mean, can you think of anything worse than it being a parent with young children and having absolutely nothing for them for mm. Christmas. I mean, it's hard. nightmare, right? So I offered to meet them at Target. Mm -hmm. And I said, maybe, oh, you know, I'll buy you something. Now, if you're a single mom on Craigslist and some guy says he's going to buy something for you, I mean, you're like, and what's the catch, right? Yeah. But I, I promised them, like, you can meet me in, you know, we'll meet in Target. There's no catch here. Mm -hmm. So they get there, and they think they're going to get maybe a present. Mm -hmm. Well, what I did is I bought them a whole cart full of stuff, yeah. right? And then we bought food. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, their worst nightmare of a Christmas becomes their greatest Christmas. It cost me mm -hmm. 300 bucks. That's a cheap, uh, cheap turnaround as yeah. far as I'm concerned, right? Mm -hmm. So it went so well, and lives were, they were, they were so mystified that mm -hmm. it did this. I st the next year, I got a lot more letters, and so I started eliciting friends to do it. Mm -hmm. And so over the last 10 years, we've helped 200 families who were oh, at wow. the brink of just absolute nightmare Christmas have the greatest Christmas of their Aww. lives. And what's Great interesting idea. about it is not only have a lot of the people that we've helped come back and say, hey, when I'm back on my feet, I would like to help you oh, wow. do that. That's fantastic. Right? But people have become Christians uh, mm -hmm. out of it. And I didn't. I didn't preach mm -hmm. to them, although they asked, why, why are you doing this, mm -hmm. right? It was the easiest way to share the gospel, mm -hmm. right? And so people have become Christians out of that experience. Yeah. But also out of it is the target employees now know we do this, oh. right? And so they see us doing this every single year, and it started to impact them as well. So... It's very simple thing. Like anybody could do that in any city in the country. You got Craigslist in your in your <laughs> neighborhood. You can do this, right? Yeah. Very simple to do. You can make a huge difference in people's lives. Please steal that idea. Steal it. It's okay. <laughs> that is great. It seems to me that um, even good Christians a lot of times feel that they they don't. There's not much they can do. Yeah. And I know that. You know, even that, they might not even have the $300 to help. So right. do you have some other ideas? Of course. The first thing you can do is we need to be in the joy business. Yeah. Okay? We need to be in the joy business. Um, we're supposed to be known for the fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you think of that list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You know the list. Okay? Right. Which of those words would you say that non-Christians use to describe the Christian community? Probably none. I would say none. Yeah. Right. So that's what we're supposed to be known by. And mm -hmm. people tend to look at us right now as very, very negative. We need, we need to be in the joy business, mm -hmm. okay? Researchers have found that con conversion happens because you know someone and you want to be more like that, them, mm -hmm. right? So whether the conversion is, wow, look how much weight she lost. <laughs> right. I yeah. want that for me, okay? Mm -hmm. That is aspirational. I want to be... Mm -hmm you mm -hmm. okay so who wants to be who wants to join our clan <laughs> if we're negative and judgmental and looking to be offended mm -hmm. they won't want to do it and yeah. we're not called to that we're called to be 
in the joy business. Right. So that's a very simple way, okay? That's one. Two, researchers have found that the majority of Christians don't know their neighbors at all. Yeah. Right? And the more we get into technology and, um, you know, more screens and more entertainment, mm -hmm. the less and less and less that people actually know each other. There's an incredible book uh, about the decline of America called Bowling Alone. And mm. it's, it really, all it is is premised on the number of people who now, you know, less about leagues and more about people bowling alone, right? Oh, wow. And so all that's to say is, you wanna be a missionary? Great, go next door, <laughs> okay? It's that simple. There mm -hmm. are, get to know your neighbors. I threw a block party because I realized when I was out walking my dog one day, the 12 houses down each of uh, my block, I was like, uh, I know people in five houses and I wave to the rest and don't know anything about them at all. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I threw a block party. We just invited everybody and said, we should know each other. Let's mm -hmm. all know each other. And they all came to that. And, it was, and what we discovered is they didn't know each other either. Oh, wow. Right? So just our facilitating having a little party in the afternoon <laughs> made a big, huge difference, yeah. right? Of just inviting people in. This mm -hmm. is not expensive stuff to right. do. It's not expensive to uh, get to know your elderly neighbor and mow the lawn for them. I, I mystified one of my neighbors. She's an elderly woman, mm -hmm. and I'm an early riser. I'm like a 4.30, 5 a.m. guy oh out jogging. <laughs> uh -huh. And I know it's really painful for her to walk all the way down her walkway and pick up her newspaper every morning. Mm -hmm. And so I started picking up her newspaper and leaving it on her front doorstep. For six months, she didn't know <laughs> how it was happening. And then she discovered that I did it, mm -hmm. right? And it led us to become friends. Right? And she's not religious, but it's allowed us to have a relationship where now she knows who I am and what motivates me. Mm -hmm. And it's opened up a whole bunch of conversations at a, simply because I picked up a newspaper in the morning and put it on somebody's doorstep. Yeah. That's, you don't need a lot of money to do that. No, right? These are don't. simple baseline, mm -hmm. simple things. And the book outlines eight or ten different ideas. Right. People are smart. They'll come up with them. Right. But once you start to have eyes. Yeah, start says, to see needs and then fill them. They're everywhere. Yeah. The Holy Spirit works through us that way, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and, and starts to work through us through the simplest things. That's the great thing about using the early church as the model is because that's what they were doing. Yeah. They were feeding people. Mm -hmm. Giving somebody a sandwich and some water is not real complicated stuff. Mm -hmm. People were mystified. Who does that? Who does yeah. that? Right? Which only led to more in incredible ways that we transform the world. Hospitals and mm -hmm. education and uh, you know, social justice, like all these things. This is our history. Mm -hmm. And we just need to get back to astonishing people on a personal level and on a corporate level again. So that leads me to think about the millennials who care very much about social justice, yeah. but they don't really have a whole lot of use for Christianity. Let's speak to that a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's, a, that's the great and terrible thing mm -hmm. uh, about the millennial generation is they care. Mm -hmm. they, they, they care more about, um, I think, the poor and the marginalized mm -hmm. uh, than, than our generation, maybe even your generation. Mm -hmm. right. And um, part of that is they... They're seeing the hypocrisy in us mm -hmm. of talking a good game about caring about these things, but then not really doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the, it's, it's a great and terrible thing that has happened in, that happened in the 20th century is uh, we were able to, as, as Christians, uh, export out uh, serving others to oh. massive organizations mm -hmm. that just frankly do it better than us. I mean, mm -hmm. God bless Compassion International, and God bless uh, the Salvation Army, and God bless World Vision for doing what they do. Right. But we took ourselves off the hook. Here's your $50 check. Here's some right. change for you. Mm -hmm. Right? Go do it. You're welcome. Right? Instead of getting our hands dirty and getting mm -hmm. into it. And I think that millennial generation looks at that and can't believe that we aren't getting our hands dirty, that we're not getting right. in there and mixing it up. And so they're willing to do that. And so some of the things that we have done in the history of uh, culture mm 
mm -hmm. have been so transformational that non-Christians, hospitals, mm -hmm. universities, okay, mm -hmm. these are these are creations of the Christian yeah. community, right. okay, and they look at them and all along the way, the people people have either said, "I love that, I want to be part of that, I want mm -hmm. a hospital," or they'll say, "I love that." I want to be part of that. I just don't want to cross in front of my hospital, but a hospital is a great idea, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of these things were such great ideas that they've become sta staples in our society, mm -hmm. right? And that's why it's incumbent upon us to find ways to astonish people with our love and our service right. so that millennials go, oh, they're doing it right. Yeah. Oh, they're doing they it. They really do. They do actually care. Well, thank you again for being our guest. Where can people find out about you and Phil and the book? Right. It's available anywhere books are sold, Christian okay. bookstores, all of that. Okay. Um, it's called The, the Way, Way Back. Back. The Way Back, how Christians blew our credibility and how we get it back. Yep. So thank you so much again, John, for thank being you. our guest. Good. I know I have